Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us after lunch for this fantastic and interesting discussion, I hope. Um, I'm Valerie Hopkins. I'm the Southeast Europe correspondent for the Financial Times, and I'm joined by the Macedonian president, uh, Stevo Penderovsky, or shall I say the president of North Macedonia, when we met uh, five years ago Greeks. now. I saw a few Greeks in the room, please. <laughs> um, when we met five years ago now, the, your country had not changed its name. It wa we were in front of the government building. Um, as tents were camped out, there were paint bombs being uh, deployed across the city, um, and, and a lot has happened since then. I mean, you went from being mentioned as a captured state to... You have been the direct witness of revolution. That, that revolution has a name, colorful, colorful revolution, which goes in two parts in 2015 and 16. and uh, I just tell some of my friends I haven't seen for a long time that in 2016, in the progress report of the European Commission, we have been described as the captured state. You can imagine that. And for only two and a half years later, we have, been, we have become the members of NATO and opened the door for the European Union. So such a quick recovery from one regime to a, to a democratic uh, rule as I think never happened in the recent history on the continent at least quick, but still not without obstacles. I mean, this time last year, I think um, the whole region was reeling from this uh, emphatic no that came from, from Paris. Um, you finally unlocked the doors in March to I have quite an open interesting meeting with President Macron uh, immediately oh, after that very, very negative decision by the European Union. At least it was perceived like that by, the, by many people in North Macedonia. Uh, that was in October last year, and uh, we have been spoke, speaking about the demands by the French side to have the new methodology for, for entering the European Union or negotiating. And we have been, I can tell you, we have been a bit uh, confused because there have been some voices coming from Brussels, from the very high political levels, speaking about the possible alternatives to the membership. And I asked directly President Macron, are you really preparing some alternative form of membership <laughs> for the countries from the Western Balkans? He said, no, we would like that process to be more efficient. And at the end of that process, people to see really tangible results. Nothing more, nothing less. And that proven correct. We are uh, waiting for starting the, the negotiations and uh, we do not have any fear of the new methodology. We think that is the best way to progress. I was just going to ask you about that. So, okay, we can fast forward. In March, <laughs> we finally got to, you finally got the green light, um, and then the COVID pandemic hit, um, what, two days ago now? I got a massive uh, package in my email of the new methodology, accession framework, financial package. I'm wondering if you can respond a bit. What do you think? And you had a commissioner in Varhe yesterday. In yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw him. That he, was in, he was in Skopje. He has a really busy regional agenda. He was uh, yesterday in Skopje and in Tirana, and today I think he's completing that regional journey with the rest of the regional capitals, four of them, the rest of them, the six all in all, that was a really uh, hectic activity on his part. I, I think that this time the European Union, not only the Commissioner Varkhely, but really delivered. And I can tell you that we have been uh, really shocked to see the new so-called investment and economic package. And uh, they have been speaking within that package about 9 billion euros. Most of them, if not all of them, grants that never happened before. You know, European Union, to be honest with you, then I'm speaking on behalf of the ordinary people, not only in my country, but for all the Balkan people, then have, been, have, have a perception about the European Union as, a, as an entity, as an international organization, which is speaking of rule of law, uh, rights of the citizens, uh, that kind of a stuff, only, only talk and nothing concrete. Now they are coming forward with a very, very concrete package. And why this package is very, even more important uh, during this period of the time? Because we are speaking about the world turmoil caused by the pandemic. And the European Union solidarity, which has been questioned many times in the past, has now proven to anybody that is real, that is existent, and is really delivering. You know, apart from that, I would like to call that a rescue package for the member states, for the current member states, with many billions and trillions of, of euros. Now they are taking care for the Western Balkan as well. That's a hugely encouraging sign for the people in the region because from times to times, we have an impression that the, not only the bureaucrats, but the politicians in Brussels are simply trying to forget the Balkan course of developments. And everybody thinks, okay, they are on the right path. Maybe for five, maybe for 15 years, they will become the institutionally part of the European Union. Many of them are already in NATO, so the, finished, the, the business is finished in the Balkans. That's not true. That's not true. 
and now they are really showing to everybody living in the region that they really do care about the, the development scene, that natural, not only geographically, I would say historically, civilizationally, and institutionally part of Europe. Um, that's fantastic. And uh, do you have any plans yet how you're planning to spend some of this 9 billion euros? I mean, I know that's <laughs> the region. What are the priorities? The, uh, the internal ratio of these quotas or sums of money is still not uh, decided. I, the day before yesterday, I saw for a short period of time that our Prime Minister Zaev and we have been calculating <laughs> then. Uh, I think that we are speaking about the 18 million people, all in all, living in six Western Balkan countries and dividing that 9 billion euros. And that's kind of a joke, of course. And then approximately 1 billion euros should be dedicated to, allocated to North Macedonia. No, I'm joking. Uh, all the, these sums of money have been, are going to be allocated according to the projects we, we have submitted. All six Western Balkan countries have submitted before to the European Commission. So that's not uh, an empty talk or just uh, something in the air then. It's very concrete and we have very concrete projects and very eager to start with all of them because they are speaking, the projects are speaking about better infrastructure in the region. They're speaking about a better ecology and better environment for the people. Uh, speaking about uh, re renewable energy, replacing coal, for example, with renewable energy. And all of that is, is badly needed in the region, especially. That is the primary task. Speaking, I'm speaking now about the Green Deal for the European Union, but certainly that's not m less important for the, for the people living in the Western Balkans. And uh, how about the timeline now? I mean, the Germans have said that they really want to, to move things forward during their presidency, but a lot needs to happen, and there are so many challenges now within the EU, uh, in the world. Um, do you think that there's going to be enough drive and push to, to open uh, the first chapters um, by the end of the year? No, uh, it is not so easy in the Balkans. <laughs> We have done a great deal of, 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 of job in the meantime with the PRESPA agreement, especially with our neighbors uh, from Greece. But now we have some outstanding issues to resolve with our Bulgarian friends in Sofia, and I can tell you that we are ready to do that by the end of the German presidency, by the end of this year, and finally to start, but really to start with the negotiations with the European Union. And I can tell you that the political activities have already been decided on our part. Then our Prime Minister will be, I think, in two or three weeks at the maximum in Sofia to speak with uh, his Bulgarian friend and counterpart, uh, Borisov. Uh, tomorrow, our foreign minister will, uh, will be in Sofia to meet our dear guest, my friend, Katya. Uh, so, and what is important part of that bilateral agreement on good neighbor relations signed in 2017 by the old and new prime ministers in Sofia and Skopje is the commission of historians who are dealing some, with some historical controversies. We have scheduled uh, tentatively, scheduled for 15th and 16th of this month, uh, uh, that's a new meeting of that commission because due to the COVID pandemic and due to our Parliament elections, which has been twice postponed in the meantime, they have not been in action at all. So we are doing everything possible to realize all obligations we have signed in good faith from that agreement, and we have no any doubt that our Bulgarian friends will do the same. A historical commission for, for the future. Um, <laughs> well, and, and if that doesn't happen, are you worried a little bit that, that there could be another swell of frustration with the EU? I mean, we've seen, you know, after last October, they, we had, there had to be new elections. Before that, the referendum uh, on uh, accepting a, a difficult uh, cha identity change for, for many citizens of your country. And, and, and many people felt frustrated that there were more and more and more obligations. Uh, being I, would, I would like to say that that was the identity cha change for the citizens. We have changed the name of the country, but with the PRESPA agreement precisely, the all vital, basic identity uh, marker, so to say, of the Macedonian nation has been preserved. Has been preserved. And that was even ratified in the Greek parliament. So that was a huge step forward for all of us. Because, you know, we have been discussing for almost a quarter of a century with our Greek friends and have never been ready to sign an agreement. But regardless of the award of the, of the end of, at the end of the day, NATO, European Union, if we have not seen before that a clear guarantee is in place that we are not going to change our identity as a people, so that is out of question in the 21st century. So that agreement was good, looking to the future, but preserving what is basic for both sides. So, uh, but you, to go back to your question, you are right with the, with the frustration, not only because of that waiting on prolonged start of negotiations 
for us and for the Republic of Albania. Do not forget that we have been treated as a kind of a package last year. Uh, if something like that happen again, I can tell you that's going to be very frustrating for the people in the country, for the political elite in the country, because we cannot persuade the people that they should wait for decades and decades to finally start, not enter the European Union, but start with the negotiations. And everybody knows that it's a lengthy and very, very difficult process. But it's going to be very bad uh, omen, so to say, for the European Union, for their attractiveness for the prospective candidates. Is this something you you were you spoke about being treated as a package, and you see that increasingly uh, there is an initiative in the region to try to work together, also one that is heavily supported by Brussels. Um, how do you see uh, the the push, in the la especially strong in the last nine months, for whatever you want to call it, a mini Schengen, a regional economic area, the f f an initiative focused on the four freedoms? Do you think that that will help Macedonia, or does it really, in the short term at least? really just make a Serbian economy stronger and help Serbia? You hear this crit criticism no, quite a lot. No, the then uh, it's very interesting. Though. If that was the case, then uh, apart from my country, because Prime Minister Zai was one of the of founders, so to say, of that initiative, immediately with Serbian and Albanian uh, Prime Minister, Serbian President, Albanian Prime Minister, then Albanians from the Republic of Albania will certainly not join that initiative if the end result of that process would be strengthening the Serbian economy. You know why. <laughs> Everybody knows why. So it's a very interesting uh, hybrid of the people from different ethnicities, not only from different countries, with different political outlook. Look, I would say, I will say uh, that agree that something like that should start. What is important about that initiative? That is, as far as I can remember, and I have enough of years to remember along, that was the first autonomous regional initiative then stemming from the region not being just said by somebody in Brussels and we, uh, along that copy-paste procedure, think, okay, why not? This was, for the first time, an originated from the region. And I can tell you that in the meantime, a few other countries are either joining us or uh, discussing about joining us. And that's okay. In essence, the core of the mini Schengen initiative is, as you said, for freedoms of the European Union. So why not to have, uh, maybe, the, maybe the term is not uh, quite good or, or correct to speak about Schengen, because we have one <laughs> Schengen. But the initiative as such is more than welcome, and it should be more than welcome by everybody in the region. What I would like to see, and I was one of the first, if not the first one uh, from the politicians in the region, which has publicly said some doubts, some reservations about the initiative, not because the initiative is not good or the idea is not good, but I would like to see Maxi Schengen. <laughs> all six Western Balkan countries to be in that initiative. We do not need new division line in the region who has been already divided numerous times in the past, and at present, of course. And do you see this as, as the, the, the symbolic power which it, which it really has, or do you also see a real opportunity for, for economic growth? I mean, when you see most of the co countries in the region, you know, 60, between 60 and 70 percent of their trade is with the EU specifically, right? So how do you, do you see that there's really so much room uh, to grow the economy, the trade in it, between it the is, countries? It is, it is. Uh, you know, well before Schengen mini Schengen initiative. Well, before we have even applied for the, for the membership. We, for example, we are the formally, formally speaking candidates for the EU membership since December 2005, then waiting for 16 years to start negotiations. So, well, before that, we have the EU as our biggest trading partner. And I think that the same goes for the, for the rest of the former Yugoslavia plus Albania. So, it, we are in the same geographical area. We are in a close geographical proximity. Uh, we have, especially with the countries around us, with the many, many ties from the previous times, when that uh, former states have existed, and why not to use that for the benefit of all of our citizens? So I, I cannot see how we can be the biggest trading uh, partner ever. Uh, let's say that if we wish something like that with, with uh, I don't know, with Philippines or, or with uh, South Korea or any other country which is far away, Australia. So it's quite natural to cooperate with your closest neighbors and all Europeans are our neighbors and in essence we are the same family. Um, the last time we saw one another was in March. It was my last pre-COVID conference in Skopje. Um, and you gave a very impassioned uh, keynote speech that evening about uh, what looked 
at that time very possible uh, and was still being discussed, uh, the idea of a territory exchange of Kosovo, between Kosovo and Serbia or a partition, whatever we want to call it. And you, you spoke about the disastrous consequences this could have for your country. Um, now, one pandemic and uh, one Oval Office meeting later, uh, things look a lot different. I'm wondering how you see, and maybe this will help in our next panel a bit, or you can advise me a bit, how do you see uh, Washington reasserting itself um, in uh, Balkan peacemaking, um, and, and how do you see now the, the state of play in the region compared to at the beginning of this year? In essence, you have quite different, two, quite different questions in that. Uh, I wouldn't like to, to explain or to, be, to speak at length about that. Ideas circulating around that formal negotiation process uh, between uh, Belgrade and Pristina. I have repeated my stance, and it's widely known, uh, several times before and after that uh, meeting you have mentioned. And the uh, Serbian president immediately got mad on me, <laughs> said, saying that that's not my job. Of course, uh, what we are asking for from the international mediators or everybody with a good, uh, with a good intention towards the region from the international community. The decision, when it time will come for that, on the Kosovo international status, or the agreement between Belgrade and Pristina, could be whatever they want. And they are both involving parts of that debate. If they agree on something, that's going to be period. That's going to be the final. But we wouldn't like to see everybody speaking uh, for everybody in the region, around these two countries, because we have recognized both of them. We have embassies in Belgrade and Pristina, and vice versa, they have embassies in, in Skopje. We wouldn't like to see the decision or the solution at the end of that process, which will destabilize the region additionally. So at least if they decide to swap the territories, it's up to them. But I will urge all the international interlocutors and international friends to have at least one provision plus in that agreement, saying that that's going to be eventually the sui generis decision only for that problem. And it should not be kind of a opening Pandora box and kind of to see the kind of a domino effect in the region. Because, you know, I'm the president of North Macedonia. What is my first job? To protect the national interest of the country. The, the very first interest of my country in to stay within the, the same borders. Said, of course, and I should take care about that by the end of, until the end of my term. So I am asking everybody being involved, and I think that people being involved in the discussion, not only Ambassador Lechek, but uh, Alexander Vucic and, uh, and the Kosovo delegation, they are fully aware about that. They are fully about that, aware about that. And I do not expect a huge surprises at the end of that process, but what I would like to see as, uh, as a person who is living in that region, the decision to come as soon as possible is going to be beneficial for everybody in the first place for Belgrade and for Pristina. Thank you very much, President Penderovsky. You've given us a very fruitful uh, basis for, for the continuing discussion, which will start immediately. I would like to ask everyone to stay here, especially if you're interested in the region um, and in the wider, actually, neighborhood. Um, to please remain. We will just um, do some... I will stay in the first row. Yes. I'm not going to escape. <laughs> please feel free no, to ask you. a question. And thank you again. Thank you.